Well, that was fantastic. Good evening, everyone. Great to see you. I survived. Ran the 5K. My, uh, my wife has become the runner in our family. I am the wannabe runner. I talk a big game when it comes to running. And uh, the fact of the matter is I haven't run for quite some time. And this morning when I woke up, I prayed. I said, Lord, should I, should I get out of bed and go and run? Because this could be, you know, self-destructive. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Anyway, we made it. It was a great deal of fun. And I know what someone's going to ask me. They're going to ask me, did you high-five anybody before you got to the finish line? And there was a man standing not far from the finish. He put up his hand for the high five, and I said, no way. <laughs> not after that sermon I preached. No way. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Can't do that. Yeah. You know, at the finish line, there's some, some man, I, I'm guessing he's run the 5K. You all know him, but I don't know his name. And he, and he will run the last couple of hundred yards to the finish with runners to encourage them. And he would do that again and again and again and again. And as I was standing there feeling half dead, I did not appreciate what he was doing. <laughs> great fun. It was a great day today. The 5K was good. We made it. Thank the Lord. And uh, the Pathfinder parade and the, the, the Pathfinder worship, that was fun. God bless our Pathfinders particularly the parents. If you're involved in Pathfinders, running a group or assisting with a group or helping out with a group or the fundraising or events, well, God bless you. Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, we want to encourage our kids in the church and Pathfinders and adventurers and the associated uh, events. Uh, just a great, great way of doing that. Well, do I have my friend Cin Cindy Stephan here? I think so. Cindy had a great idea. I said, I'm all in. Let's go. She's uh, bringing you some, Cindy's spent a lot of time at our It Is Written booth, and she has been telling people that if you write your name down, you may win something, and so I think we're here to tell some folks that they won something. Are we drawing, or are we just telling? The drawing takes a little while. We can do both. Oh, yeah? So what do we need to do? Do we need to draw, or do we need to tell? How many yes. are we doing? 19 names. Oh, we can't do 19. Well, we're doing more tomorrow, and then more the next day. 19 will be here. I cut my sermon in half. I can't do that. Hey, who said that's okay? Who said that? Who said that? That ain't even, that ain't even funny. I think I said it, actually. Speaking of, it was fun knowing you. <laughs> well, t we're giving away some wonderful things. Yeah, we are. T tell us what. I, want that I can't count to 19. What in the world? All right. That's probably the same person twice, but that's okay by now. Well, so can you explain what we're, uh, what we're doing? Of course I Cindy can. is one of our ministry representatives at It Is Written, and she's a Michigander. It's or a so good Michigander. to be home. Come on back. Come on back. <laughs> okay. All right. 19 is all of them, okay, I think. Okay, we're giving away this, one, this wonderful Creation Life Study Guide, and this is an eight... Eight... Is yep. eight, what do you call Health based it? Bible studies, Thank and they're you. awesome, done in association with uh, Advent, well, Advent Health. The, it says, the organization formerly known as Florida Hospital, Advent mm -hmm. Health, yes. and their creation life uh, stuff. It's excellent. Here are the It Is Written Bible Study Guides. We just had them translated. They're in Hindi in India now, and they're translating them into a lot of languages. Some very. A lot of languages. We just got some exciting reports from a Hmong group that is studying online and so on. These are just, I'd love to tell you the stories, but maybe that's what I, sh sh I will do before we're done. So I think I've got enough here, and we'll imagine that. Uh, what else we're we We're also got? giving away a Bible. The It Is Written Everyday Bible. That's a great, great, great hard-covered Bible. Bible. Here's the My Place with Jesus Children's Bible. It's the best one you can find. It's fantastic. Fan. Oh, I said that because fantastic. my wife uh, compiled this, create, she, I mean, she didn't write it. Don't get me wrong. It's a Bible. Yeah, my wife was good, but she's not that good, you know. Uh, but but the, the resources, all the My Place with Jesus, study, all the Bible studies are in the back. It's fantastic. It even has a cover that you can turn inside out so the kids can draw on the inside of the cover. It's just great fun. And speaking of the Bible studies, we're yeah. also giving away the children's Bible studies yeah. as well. 
Yep, all right. And then we are also giving away a couple of the coloring books. Outstanding. The very treasure coloring books, too. All right. Well, I know this guy. Hey, how do you decide who does what? We need 19 names. We're going to do it quick so as not to burn up too much time. Well, the quickest way is yes. just give me 19 names, and yes. then I'm going to pray at the booth, and then the Lord will decide who gets what. All right, all right, all right. So I think what you're saying is you've got to arm wrestle. No, arm wrestle people. No. Okay, listen to this. I know, I know this guy. His name is Andy, and that's young Mr. Sutton. All right, all right, all right. So there we go. And his dad is a missionary, and he's going to be here later this week, I was told, by Andy and his grandma. Uh, this is Lori Radala. You can count them. This is Carol Smith. Three. And this is uh, Walter Brahman from Edmore. And uh, this is Matthew and Nicole Marsh. Oh. And this must be Sarah Zimmerman, and I'm glad. And this person scrunched it all up and said, you'll notice it if I do that. And that was the strategy that worked. That's, um, I'm reading the mind. That's Gail Metzger, who's here from Montana, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is Dawn Johnson. I found it so confusing in the United States. People refer to Dawn as Don. And then they'll talk about someone's brother whose name is Don. And I, I've been here more than half my life, and I can't figure that out. <laughs> Melissa, uh, it looks like a Polish name, but I think it's Pristup or Pristep. Uh, and I'm sorry if my pronunciation isn't great, but that is uh, how it is. James Morisot. That's a kind of a fancy Morrissey. James Morisot. Elaine Morell, are you counting? Mm -hmm. What are we Who up to? Who else is counting? Yes, that's 11. Good job. Really? Yes. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Oh, look, I got 19. How about that? <laughs> uh, Sue Collier yeah. and Angie Dean. Yeah. And uh, look at that. You got to love that. Is that, the best, is that the best town name in the world? Bad axe. That's a best <laughs> bad axe. And that's something? I missed that, but you can tell me later. Bad axe. That's great. I, I think I'd be scared to live in a town named Bad Axe. Kim and Vic Roach, who are not from Bad Axe. Uh, Jessica Burns, who's from Arizona. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Not Jessica Burns or Arizona, but something like that. Sherilyn Hill. And uh, Sandy Hassenflug, I think I got that right. I'm trying to read the hieroglyphics. Oh, Mike Lumbert. Mm -hmm. You know, I spoke, spoke yesterday to Pastor Mike Lambert, and I thought I saw Mike Lambert, but this is Mike Lumbert mm -hmm. from Mason. One more? Well, you said 19, I so think. I stopped counting. Chris McGrath, who's here from uh, Ohio. So yes. thank you very much. See Cindy at the booth. We'd love to share some resources with you that will bless you. Uh, and we want to thank you from It Is Written for being here and pray that the resources will be an encouragement to you. Thank you very much. Thank you have you enough present. hands for that? I do. You do? All right, all right. That's great. You know what I'm just, I just love about this camp meeting? You've got people here from everywhere. I mean, everywhere. I'm turning around and seeing virtual neighbors from the Chattanooga area and people from further south. And I just ran into a young guy out there he came and said, hello. I said, where are you here from? He said, Alberta. And I figured he didn't mean the town of Alberta, Michigan. And he didn't. Alberta. I said, man, how, how far is the drive? He said, 30 hours. And I didn't check on the map. And I don't know exactly which part of Alberta he's here from. 30 hours. So if you're going to drive to Michigan camp meeting and take 30 hours to do it, then you are committed, or maybe you should be committed. <laughs> but I think you're committed. And I think there's a reason people would drive 30 hours to be at camp meeting. Not just because my young friend's grandma lives in the area. I'm sure that's a pretty good reason. But because when people come here to Michigan Conference camp meeting, people are blessed. You know one thing I like? I'm getting ever so slightly sidetracked here. Oh, I ran today. I won't be walking... Tell the camera guys, be, I will not be walking around the platform today. <laughs> I did my 5Ks this morning. <laughs> I'll do another 5Ks now. You know what I love about this is that if you bring your kids to Michigan camp meeting and you put them in the kids division, they're not there just to be entertained. I love that. I love that they're going to meet Jesus and they're going to hear the Bible and they're going to be taught something and they have a great time and it'll be wonderful fun but they're going to get into the Bible and they're going to grow 
when my 19-year-old daughter says, oh, man, I wish I could come to Michigan Conference camp meeting this year. And she's not, you know, the intent is not to come and see all of her friends from school. The intent is to come here and be in a place where the Spirit of God moves. That really speaks to this dad's heart. So that's very, very, very cool, I think. All righty, let us pray and expect that God would speak to us tonight. Let's pray now. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful that we can be in your presence tonight. Thankful, thankful for Jesus. Thank you for the great love of God for all of us. Thank you that you would condescend to speak to us tonight. Now, we come to you as sinners. Not a single one of us is going to strut into your presence and say, you have to save me because I'm good. Instead, we pray as did the publican in the story in the Bible, and we say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Feed us tonight with the bread of heaven. I pray that every one of us will go from this place with something that has drawn us closer to you and bent our hearts and mind and lives even more closely in your direction. Guide us now, please, dear Lord. We pray, we thank you in Jesus' name. Please say with me now, amen and amen. I don't want to sound like a broken record. If you're under the age of 20, ask your parents what I mean when I say a broken record. Just going to point something out to you, and, 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 and then we're going to go in a, in a certain direction. Over the last little while, we've noticed that things, things in the world just seem to be a little upside down. You've heard me say that, but, but, but that's okay. Continue to hear of, of, of reports of weather systems and storms not seen in a hundred years. Flooding in Europe was it a year or so ago. Haven't seen anything like it in a hundred years. We're getting these disasters piling up on top of each other, and this isn't apocryphal data I'm talking about. It's easy to find this now, even being reported in the secular news media. They're wondering what's going on. Of course, of course, they're blaming climate change, and I'm not here to comment on that, but I'm going to comment on that before too long. Whenever the subject of a mass shooting comes up, I say, just hold on a moment. There'll be another one soon. It's a dark sort of a thing to say, and I mean no offense, but it's just a commentary on where we are in the world right now. And of course, recently in Uvalde, Texas, another terrible tragedy. And if you even only have one eye on the news, you would have heard about more terrible shootings like this in recent times. And then, of course, we want to, and, and we should, but we want to search for reasons and we want to find solutions. And so we say, it's, it's a gun problem, and undoubtedly, if the fellow hadn't had a gun, he wouldn't have been able to shoot a gun. We say, we've got to fix this thing. The problem is guns. That's, again, again, no, no, if you're looking for me to get political, I'm not going to, and, and please don't take offense. So the problem is this, and, and, and the problem is that. You know, years ago, the problem was El Nino, and then it became La Nina. And now it's, it's global warming. And I'm not here to say it's a, not a thing. I'm not going to say that. I think you'd be some kind of fool to suggest that we can continue to pollute at will and then not to be some kind of consequence, hack down the Amazon rainforest at a great rate of knots and say there will not be any blowback. You'd be mad to suggest that. But I'm not here talking about the reasons because I'm ultimately going to talk about the reason. You know, poor old flight attendants getting assaulted on the job. I don't say that with any flippancy at all. They've said that incidents of anger and, uh, and angry behavior have increased dramatically on aircraft recently, and they say it's due to the mask thing, which now isn't a thing, but until recently it was. People didn't like to be told that they had to wear a mask, and so they're getting angry on planes. You know, I don't buy that. Because every person who got on a plane wearing a mask and was angry had clicked online and said, click, I'll wear one. So if you do that, you have zero right to be belligerent or ornery when you get on a plane. And by the way, why would you want to be anyway? Your plane is late and you blame the flight attendant. So it's his fault. He called the pilot and he said, go slowly. Let's make the plane late. There's a man in row 30 who's desperate to make his connection so he can get to a family reunion 
or a business appointment. Slow down. I've never heard a flight attendant make that phone call. It's not their fault. But the point being, people are angry, angry skies, fly the angry skies. They want to tell us it's because of masks. We look around and we become a little concerned because, be concerned because powerful media companies are even more powerful than they've ever been. That's just a fact. It is alarming that you can have a device like this and be tracked. That's alarming. Now, don't worry. If you didn't have one of these, but you did have a credit card, you can still be tracked because they will know where you're buying stuff. Every gas station you stop at, it's marking somewhere that you are clearly on the move. Uh, even in the days before all of this newfangled stuff, I'll tell you a little story. There was a man who went down to his local Target. He was angry, angry because he had... His daughter had received in the mail some advertisements for pregnancy-related products. What are you trying to do? Are you encouraging my daughter? What is all of this? So angry. And then the, 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 the man at Target, the manager, was so apologetic. Oh, we're so sorry. Sending your daughter these advertisements for young mother stuff. But Target smart. Their research taught them that based on what people buy, they can know something about that person. So she was buying large quantities of this and small quantities of that. Their research said pregnant women buy this stuff. It was a few weeks later, the same angry dad went down to the same target and spoke to the same manager and said, I owe you an apology. My daughter is actually pregnant. So that happened some years ago before you started carrying this thing just like you did. But now there are apps on your phone most likely that literally track you. I mean, draw a map of your movements. And you're going to say, ah, but I'm not. You're going to say, why would anybody misuse data like that? Can you tell me the last time data like that wasn't misused? As long as the potential is there, flawed and sinful human beings will find a reason to abuse that kind of privilege, collecting that sort of information. And now, of course, if you say the wrong thing, you can be deplatformed. And what is the wrong thing? The wrong thing is whatever they decide the wrong thing is. The Internet has turned into a mob. This is an old story. I might have even told it here before. I don't know. A few years ago, a New York City-based PR executive got on a plane at JFK. She was flying to South Africa. As she was leaving, she posted a joke to Twitter. It was an awkward joke. I don't think it was a funny joke. Uh, but it was meant as a joke, and there was no offense meant there. If a late-night talk show host had said exactly the same thing, people would have laughed uproariously. Someone would have held up a sign in the studio saying, laugh, laugh, laugh. Everybody would have thought he or she was a bit of a hero and just, what a funny guy. But this young lady turned off her phone, settled back for the ride, and someone read the tweet and decided they didn't like the look of it. And they said online, let's destroy her life. But they didn't describe her in nearly as acceptable terms as I just did. Her life was ruined. Her good job was lost. She spent two years in seclusion because that's what's happened out there now. Uh, when a young woman survived a train crash that killed eight people and then tweeted that she hopes she finds her violin that she left on the train, she was mercilessly ridiculed and she was attacked and people said disgusting things. Fifteen years ago, anybody would have said, oh, sorry to hear, to hear you had that experience. Do hope you get your violin back. They're not inexpensive things. But now straight into the gutter, a woman from Canada who tweeted this, men aren't women, was banned from Twitter, while the person who wrote that they would, and I quote now, like to slap the taste out of the mouth of the woman who lost her violin in a tragic train crash, of course, was not sanctioned in any way. It's ugly out there. It's ugly. So where are we today as a society? As a society? Now, careful. The wise man wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 that there is no new thing under the sun. 
nothing we see today is new. Oh, the internet is new, relatively new. There wasn't one of those a hundred years ago. But nothing we see is new. Murder rates in this country are rising, in some places alarmingly, but murder rates are still way down, way down from where they were in the early 1980s. In fact, a couple of years ago, the homicide rate in this country was roughly half of what it was in 1980, 81, 1982. Abortion rates evidently are down. And while I do not mean to harm anyone who may have had an abortion and is dealing with the regrets of that, it's still, I think, fair to acknowledge that what we have going on in our midst, largely unseen because it's behind hospital walls that your eyes cannot penetrate, is a holocaust. An utter, utter, utter shameful holocaust. But of course, abortions were being performed long before abortion was legalized. And one of the reasons, one of the reasons given to legalize abortion is that women who were caught out by whatever the circumstances were and decided they needed an abortion would often get a back alley abortion, endanger their lives, and not just the poor indefensible child, or defenseless, sorry, the poor defenseless child would die, but the mother might as well. So the point is, abortion was taking place long before it was legalized and long before it became merely another form of contraception. So I'm going to ask you what's going on, and then I'm going to tell you. Several things, several things are going on. It's the nature of human beings to spiral down and not spiral up. That, that, that's just the way we are. A person starts using marijuana, they don't all do this. By the way, the idea to legalize marijuana, absolute madness. Absolute madness. Someone's going to say, ah, but sick people need it for pain. I had a doctor tell me it's just not very good pain medication. There's other medication far more effective than that. But I'm not talking about pain. I'm not talking about medicine. I'm talking about regular old use. What a dumb idea it was to legalize that. But what happens is that in so many cases, you start with marijuana, and then you've got to push it a little bit. You've got to go a little heavier, got to get a little deeper. I'm promising you, the person they found dead in an apartment with a needle hanging out of his arm didn't start with a needle. He or she started with something like marijuana. That's the human way, you see. You start with that which is more socially acceptable, pornography. No one starts with child pornography. They start with that which is promoted and accepted and laughed about in society. They start there. Society's got a great double standard with pornography. If a politician were caught doing that sort of thing, she or he would maybe lose their job, but your friend in the workplace is just, a, just one of those guys. It's a crazy double standard. But people start with what's acceptable, and ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you've been living under a rock or not, but it's acceptable out there unfortunately. And then they move in time to that which is worse and more extreme, that which is harder, that which is truly, truly vile. Solomon started life like most other men, other than he was born into some wealth. He was born royalty. And then he married, and then he married again, and then he married again, he repeated the process until he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. But if you've read the book Prophets and Kings, whether you remember it or not, you read that the author wrote that from being one of the greatest kings that ever wielded a scepter, Solomon became effeminate. And you don't need to look in a thesaurus or a dictionary to figure out what that means. So Solomon started where he should have started when it came to intimacy. He got kind of carried away. What are you doing with, a, with 300 mistresses and 700? What are you doing with one wife and 999 mistresses? 
if you're not just getting bored with the whole thing. And if you're getting bored, you move on to that which is just a little more edgy and that which may not be polite to talk about in mixed company. His first step in the wrong direction became a free fall into the abyss of sin and wickedness. You could say that as a society, we are reaping what we have sown. The prophet Hosea wrote, they have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. There are consequences for your actions. Parent, if you are unwise enough, unthinking enough to think that the best babysitter for your kid is a device. You are sowing to the wind, and one day you will reap the whirlwind when your child, as a child, says that she or he is not interested in Sabbath school. Don't blame the Sabbath school teacher. Take a look in the mirror and ask yourself if your modern parenting did not inculcate into your child a lack of love for God. That's more than likely what happened. Years ago, we heard what they were teaching at the local universities. You remember that? We heard what they were teaching, and we said, where in the world is this heading? And now we know. It was heading right here. We've arrived. I'm not saying it's not going to get worse, but all the work that the devil has been patiently doing day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, setting the scene for great overmastering deceptions in earth's last days, that work is paying off. All of the madness was leading here. We woke up and we said, here is not good. To paraphrase the prophet Isaiah, the world is now calling evil good and good evil, putting darkness for light and light for darkness, bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We ought to think about this. If you're not for it in society today, irrespective of what it is, there is very little tolerance for you. Now, I've said this before. I say it again. Challenge we face is thinking that we can change this. Thinking that one day it's all going to go away. Thinking that religion is going to rise up and sweep away the sin that we see in the world. Thinking that there's some politician who's going to come along and right all the wrongs. Too late. It isn't going to happen. I understand that some politicians stand for what you like and some stand against what you like. But if you're honest you will discover that no matter which of the major parties you support, they are merely opposite sides of exactly the same coin. We have a broken, broken world. You cannot expect broken people to fix the problems we see in the world today, particularly when many of those problems suit the interests of people in power. Now, it would be wrong to say that a vote or a campaign or a protest cannot help. Oh, that would be wrong. Thank God Rosa Parks refused to sit in the back of the bus. Thank God Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had a dream and then acted to bring that dream to pass. If he did not, there might have been, we might still be in the midst of Jim Crow. And by the way, let me, let me plug a little museum about an hour from here. Am I right in saying that Big Rapids is about an hour from here? There's a university in Big Rapids. If you're interested in this sort of thing, and I am, you ought to go and check out the Jim Crow Museum that they have there. Just Google Jim Crow Museum, Big Rapids. Don't go if you get queasy easily. But you ought to go and you ought to take your kids and show them what this nation was like openly, unabashedly, not many years ago. It's the sort of thing I believe every person ought to see for the purpose of making a declaration in one's heart, this must not happen again. And so without protest, maybe, maybe we'd be a whole lot more broken than we are today. There are times it may help you. But ladies and gentlemen, what we find as we look around the world today and as we look into the Bible is there's a reason for ecological disasters. There's a reason 
for the mad-headed decisions that are made that are pushing us closer and closer and closer to the brink of financial ruin. There is a reason that the United States and Russia are fighting a proxy war right now in Ukraine. Now, by the way, this might be a political statement, I don't know. If you think this is a war about A, B, or C, you're wrong. The politicians have said it openly. This is a proxy war. But the United States has learned her lessons. Years ago, we fought proxy wars with China. And we sent our own men to be slaughtered or to die, to give their lives bravely, of course, but we sent them off to be killed in Vietnam and Korea. And now we're fighting a proxy war. We've learned. We're letting Ukrainians die now. Our boys and girls are safe at home, and that's good. Why? Why is there a proxy war? Why? We know, it, we know it's, it's dragging on. They say prices are going up. They say uh, oil is going to be in shorter supply. They say things are going to be destabilized. You say... Couldn't you fix that? Couldn't you fix that? Surely you could, you could fix that, couldn't you? I think you could. I think you could fix it like that. Why in the world would people not? Now, you're going to talk about political this and that, but I'm going to give you the real answer in just a moment. We see this craziness going on in the world, and we say, why? Why? Well, there's a biblical reason, a biblical reason. And I want to share with you some of that biblical reason in revelation and chapter six six of the seven seals are found the seventh is described in revelation chapter eight and it equates with the ending of the high priestly ministry of jesus in the heavenly sanctuary then jesus returns in between times you read about the 144,000 that special group who do not receive the mark of the beast, they do receive the seal of God, and they are alive and on the earth when Jesus comes and they are ready to meet him. Read about that group right there in Revelation chapter 7. Having settled into all truth, they have surrendered to God before and then during the troubles of earth's last times. They keep the commandments of God. They have the testimony of Jesus Christ. We read that in the book of Revelation. And then in Revelation chapter 7, we read this. Right in the midst of this, After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. This is God restraining an overwhelming tide of evil. But we know that that restraint will not go on ad infinitum. And we know that. Once before God destroyed this world, he destroyed it with a flood. And prior to the destruction of the earth with a flood, God said, my spirit will not always strive with men. In the case of Noah's day, God said, I'm giving him 120 years. Now, contrary to what some people want you to think, God has not given us dates and times down here in the close of time. Please don't go there. Please don't say that you can take the 1260 days and then know that from a certain decree or a certain stake in the ground, we've got, you don't know that. And it's just better that you acknowledge that sometimes Adventists uh, fall into the trap of knowing too much. And then we think we know more than we actually do. Be a little humble about what you know about the Bible. We know the big picture. We know some of the details. We don't know them all. But one day we're going to know easily as much as we need to. So we don't know when Jesus is coming back. We don't know when certain laws are going to be enacted. We don't know. But we know it's going to happen. And so we want to occupy until Jesus comes. But I read this statement in the book called Education. Angels are now restraining the winds of strife that they may not blow until the world shall be warned of its coming doom. But a storm is gathering, ready to burst upon the earth. And when God shall bid his angels loose the winds, there will be such a scene of strife as no pen can picture. We take this a little further. Seventh-day Adventists are not the only people to say this. 
The Bible tells us and teaches clearly what we just read from Genesis about Noah and the flood makes it clear that God right now has been for some time is withdrawing the Holy Spirit from this earth. And that's what's taking place. Let me read again. This is from the book Prophets and Kings. I mentioned that book earlier. The time is at hand when there will be sorrow in the world that no human balm can heal. The Spirit of God is being withdrawn. Disasters by sea and by land follow one another in quick succession. She wrote this decades ago. How frequently we hear of earthquakes and tornadoes of destruction by fire and flood with great loss of life and property. Apparently, these outbreaks are capricious, sorry, these calamities are capricious outbreaks of disorganized, unregulated forces of nature, wholly beyond the control of man. But in them all, God's purposes can be read. They are among the agencies by which he seeks to arouse men and women to a sense of their danger. So what's going on? School shootings. Why? Guns. I'm sure there's a conversation that should be had about guns, but that's not the reason why. When my father-in-law was a kid growing up and rural North Carolina, every kid who drove a pickup had a, had a gun on the gun rack right inside the back window. But they didn't take him to school and shoot up the classroom. So there's a difference today. Yes, mental health is in absolute chaos today. That's one reason. Drug use, that's another, depending on which expert you listen to. But behind it all, behind the glorification of violence in our society, Oh, some government agency is spending millions of dollars funding research to see whether or not violent video games cause kids to be violent. Einstein. What a waste. Did you say what a waste of money? What a waste of money. I couldn't agree more. We know the answer to that. By beholding, you become changed. There's no mystery here. But beneath it all, behind it all, above it all, the Holy Spirit of Almighty God is being withdrawn. How else can you have people running for president? They ask him, do you support abortion all the way through to the ninth month? <sighs> Hands go up in the air. Did you think about that? I mean, supporting abortion is one thing. I'm against that, but that's one thing. But, but standing before the world and defending late-term abortion. I, I don't know what changes. Okay, there's the lust for power and the desire to be elected. I get that. But ladies and gentlemen, when it seems like there are people operating and they're not being guided by the Holy Spirit, more than likely they're not being guided by the Holy Spirit. And it would seem to me that the Spirit of God is being withdrawn. I read again, you hear of calamities by land and by sea and they're constantly increasing. What is the matter? The Spirit of God is taken away from those who have the lives of men in their hands. And Satan is coming in to control them because they give themselves to his control. Now, that does not mean that the Spirit of God is being taken away from you. It does not mean that. And this might be a conversation for another time, but we need to understand that there will come a time when Jesus will cease interceding in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So that would seem to mean that if you're busy sending your sins from here to there, hoping for someone to forgive him, Jesus, who is no longer mediator, I mean, I'll leave you to connect the dots. There would be time now for us to prepare for that time then. God won't take the Holy Spirit from you if you keep the lines of communication open with God, but around us and in the world, the Spirit of God is being withdrawn, and that's what we see happening in the world today. It's a very serious situation. 
This is why it is futile to think that you can turn to politicians and have them fix the challenges facing the world today. We have begun a downward spiral. A set of events was, a chain of events was set in motion the moment Eve bit into the fruit. Because from that moment on, human beings were not characterized by obedience. They were characterized by and governed by selfishness. I remember years ago, living in London, England, I was there for a time, and a bank reported a six-monthly profit of something like 500 million pounds. It was a great sum of money. And they celebrated by laying off 5,000 workers. Now, employers are not charities. Banks aren't there to be make-work schemes for anyone, but that did seem a little bit callous. What it is, of course, is greed. Again, you may say it's just smart business, but very often smart business is just a euphemism for the word greed. But as soon as Eve bit the fruit, greed was assured. Undoubtedly, there would be a manufacturer polluting the environment. That would not be her or his first concern, of course. Human beings were always going to seek for ways to do things easier. And so now we have automobiles. They're wonderful things, but they could kill you, and they foul the environment in a thousand different ways. Ah, the solution is electric vehicles. It's just trading one bad thing for another. And I'm not saying cars are bad. I drive one most every day. I'm, all, I'm, I'm in fully in favor of them. We think we're going to ch- save the world by saving the environment. Okay, we should be good stewards of the environment. There's no question about that. But oh, the hypocrisy of the person who stands up and gives an impassioned speech talking about why we shouldn't use plastic straws in restaurants and plastic bags in Walmart and then gets in their new car and drives home and there's 500 plus pounds of plastic in that new car, most of which cannot be recycled. Oh, the hypocrisy. Not against environmentalism, that's okay. Just don't let it be your God. And don't think that environmentalism is ultimately going to save or change too terribly much. We are greedy, we are angry, we make bad decisions, and all of that was guaranteed the moment selfishness began to reign. And as God withdraws His Spirit from the world, the sad situation we are in is exacerbated amplified, magnified. We are going from bad to worse. Once Eve ate the fruit, it was guaranteed that we would start eating food that was not good for us. We would be governed by our taste buds and not by good thinking. Harvard researchers, and I quote, Harvard researchers say that soda and sports drinks Increase the risk of dying from heart disease and breast and colon cancers. I'm not saying it's a sin to drink one. Knock yourself out. Do what you want. But the science says this stuff will kill you. And we are saying, hand me another. The people who are so enlightened, even within the church, who believe that it's okay to drink alcohol. I need to be really clear with you. It's not. It's, 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 it's foolishness. And how do we know that? Oh, don't even ask. But what you're forgetting is that for every 10 cancer deaths caused by tobacco, there are six caused by alcohol. People don't talk about the carcinogenic effects of alcohol. Why do people drink it? We just make bad decisions. Why do we make bad decisions? Because we're not governed by the Holy Spirit. Selfishness reigns now. The World Health Organization said, and you would remember this, processed meats are cancer causing they didn't beat around the bush they didn't say might be there's some scintilla of evidence that suggests they just said this stuff will kill you and we responded that is the world by buying it and consuming it in record amounts there's something kind of mad going on here politicians lie i used to wonder if they lied by mistake now i think they lie because they're liars And they lie, and not every last one. There may be one somewhere who stays only with the truth. But they trade in lies, knowing that they will not come back to bite them. 
A complicit media lets them get away with what they say. Companies lie. Your cell phone maker slowed your phone down deliberately. So you'd get frustrated and go buy a new model. How despicable is that? That's nasty. But that's where we are today. Why? Because we're selfish. And is it getting better? No, it's getting worse. And why is it getting worse? I'm not blaming the cell phone makers. The Spirit of God is being withdrawn from the earth. All of this was inevitable. As soon as there was sin, this was inevitable. So, now we've identified the problem. The question might be, what do you do about it? I'm not even asking that question. I'm sure where we're going now is going to address that. But my question really is this. What should we be like in the midst of this kind of scenario? You know what I'm saying, don't you? We had COVID, still have COVID, had COVID. Have, you, you understand. My question isn't, were you on the right side or the wrong side of the vaccine argument? That's not my question. My question isn't, were you with the good guys who wore masks or the bad guys who didn't, or the good guys who didn't, the bad guys who didn't? That, that's not the question. My question is, when your church board gathered to discuss COVID and how your church would react, how'd you act? Did the veins start bulging in your neck? Did you stand up and bang the table and make an impassioned plea for your rights? This is my right. You know, one thing Jesus never did was contend for his rights. Never, not even once, did you join a march? Someone's going to say, that's okay. Maybe it is, but I don't recall the chapter or the verse. Where is it? Maybe it's there somewhere. I read that Jesus wept. I don't read that Jesus marched. That wasn't a statement saying you should never do it, but it is a statement saying maybe you ought to think. So the question isn't, are we right or are we wrong? The question is, are we right or are we wrong? How are we acting in this? It's really, really, really important to realize that God's people don't just keep the commandments of God, but they manifest the character of Jesus. You could train a seal to keep the Sabbath. Did you ever read the book, The Seventh-day Ox? An ox kept the Sabbath. We have a Sabbath-keeping cat in our family. In the winter, the cat sleeps in the garage. I wish he didn't, but the winter is cold, and I have to have some compassion on the cat. Cat's name is Jonah. <laughs> Disappears periodically. You open the door from the garage, and it, you know, you, the cat will run straight into the kitchen. Six days a week, right through the kitchen, through the dining room, to the door where the food is way over there. Every Sabbath, the cat runs into the house and puts on the brakes right at the pantry and waits. Six days a week, the cat gets that dried food. It's my daughter's cat. I don't know why she does that to the cat. It's awful stuff. I'd, I'd never eat it, but she serves. The, but on the Sabbath, she does something special for the cat. And she gets a tin and opens up, the, uh, opens up the tin and serves this cat wet food. Every seventh day, that cat stops at the pantry, doesn't take another step, ignores the dried food, knows it's the Sabbath, stops right there, eats the good stuff. <laughs> Sabbath keeping cat. You can teach a cat what day the Sabbath is. A cat, you can't teach a cat anything. But we taught the cat what day the Sabbath is. It's just kind of caught on. So if you know what day the Sabbath is and you keep the Sabbath, I don't think we award you extra points. My cat knows what day the Sabbath is. The question is, what kind of person are you on the Sabbath? Or on the other six days. Friend of God, it's time to do a moral inventory. 
Time to take a good long look at ourselves and ask ourselves if we're just rule keepers or are we being transformed by the renewing of our mind? God bless you if you got the whole church to do things your way during COVID. What a hero. How many people did you offend? How many people did you alienate? That family stopped coming. If they believe like that, we don't want them around here anyway. I think there's got to be a way to, to, to approach this thing in such a way as we don't offend anyone, that we don't run off anyone. Now, I understand if people get their nose out of joint about nothing. You can't, you can't help that. But, but we're to be bridge builders, aren't we? We're to be Christians, aren't we? Aren't we to show love to others? If you show love to the people who agree with you, there's nothing great about that. You got to show love to people who disagree with you. You got to be the person on the plane that when the flight attendant is up, mask, you go, oh, yeah, sorry about that. Put the mask on. Well, remember, you clicked, you promised. I remember hearing a story about two preachers who were at a restaurant. And the waitress, I don't know what she did, and it was a waitress. She maybe brought the wrong thing, or the, 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 the food wasn't hot enough, or mixed up the order or something, and the one minister was getting increasingly impatient with her. And then he began to chastise her. You know, I'm just surprised at the quality of service here, and I'm surprised that you can't do so many simple things right, and I'm just amazed that you keep getting it wrong. After he'd served it up to her three or four times and she went back to fix something else, his friend across the table said, when she comes back, I dare you to witness to her. <laughs> Are we passing those kind of tests? Oh, Jesus is coming back and we want to be right. We want to be right. We want to have the day right. But based on what I saw during COVID, you're going to get a whole lot of people who've got the day right and do it all wrong and stink it up for the rest of us. Instead of making friends, making enemies. Instead of waiting for the time of trouble, bringing it forward so that it comes tomorrow instead of next week. And no need to do that. You read in the great controversy, there were some fellows who put placards attacking the mass outside the chambers of the king. The king got out of bed, saw these things attacking the mass, and there was major persecution that came simply because these cats did something dumb and not something wise. You understand, right? Did they say the right thing? Factually correct. God bless them. They were against the mass. Sure, no one's, unless you're Catholic, you shouldn't be in favor of the mass. So they were right, but they went about the right thing in the wrong way. I mean, I challenge you. If you're on the church board, and, and thank the Lord where I go to church, our church boards are placid, they're, they're peaceful. I mean, you almost wish that someone would get their nose out of joint because it's getting boring. There's so much tranquility there. But if you're on a church board where it's not always tranquil, I dare you, I challenge you to enter the church board meeting saying, I'll be a peacemaker here. I'll see how we can bring people around. I'll see how we can connect people rather than drive people apart. Now, that was the way Jesus did it. Ah, Jesus, there were times, though, he got in the grill of the Pharisees and he really read them the right act. Yeah, but not many. And if you can claim to have as close a connection as Jesus did with the Holy Spirit, then you go ahead and do exactly the same. But until you can be confident of that, you might want to walk with a little bit of humility. I may have used this verse before, but I don't mind. It's a great verse. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we read this. You know, I'm going to back up to verse 5. I was going to start in verse 6, but verse 5 is a great verse. Take a look at that verse with me. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. There we are. We are to be servants. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God has called us to reflect the character of Jesus to the world. Not always easy. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, you want to honk and shake your fist. I understand that. 
someone backs into your car in the parking lot, your first thoughts aren't always those of charity. Uh, we're in the midst of character development, but we can pray at times like that and say, God, uh, set a watch before my mouth and keep the doors of my lips. Let me represent Jesus here. When we're done in this transaction, let that person not say, whatever church, that guy's part of, I don't want to be part of it. Let that person say, in spite of the difficult situation, she or he handle themselves in a very appropriate way. For we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That's us. We are jars of clay. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. This is yielding to Christ so that his will is done in our lives. And if you can do that when it's 72 degrees and there's a gentle breeze, again, I'm not going to erect a statue in your honor. It's when things are miserable. Then we are called to yield to Jesus when everything inside of us is rising up in anger. When that thing, in, when the, the, the old man is somehow coming back to life and threatening to conquer that Christian you've become, it's then that we cry out to Jesus and we say, God, do not let me disgrace your throne. Don't let me drag your name into the mud. Lord, let me represent Jesus. Let people know that this Seventh-day Adventist is a force for good. This is somebody who's representing Jesus. This is somebody who's Jesus I want to know. That's our calling in this world. <clears throat> Notice what Paul went on to write. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest. Now, if you can memorize the 28 fundamentals, great. Like, really, that's great. If you've got great education, bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, that's great too. Well, sincerely, congratulations. Without advanced education, the Reformation would never have happened. These were men of great intellect who stood before councils and kings and defended righteousness by faith. But education alone is not what we want. It's great to go to church and be educated. Among Christians, Adventists are very, very well educated academically and spiritually. But if we major on that and we minor on the character of Jesus, we've got it all inverted. If people knew us for not knowing a whole lot, but boy, they're like Jesus, that'd be enough. Friend of God, this is our challenge in earth's last days to reflect to the world the character of Jesus in a world that frustrates us, angers us, treads on our toes, wounds our sensibilities. We are being called to accept all manner of things. You don't have to accept them. But if you reject them, do so in a spirit of kindness and grace representing the character of Jesus. This is important. Oh, but John, you don't know what they're like. Oh, it's so tough. No, 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 read the Bible. The Bible says that our light affliction, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, here today and gone eventually, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Why, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Or oh, friend, we look around in the world today and we see and we see and we see and we see, but, but we're looking too low. Lift up and focus on the things that are unseen. Remember that God is in this world doing a great work. The Spirit of Almighty God is working a great work, a great work. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Jesus is coming back soon. And ours is not to be the angry one, but the Christian one. The Bible says, love your enemies. That is a command. Keep the Sabbath and hate your enemies, you're not keeping the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath ought to have a sanctifying effect. Go to church, but you make it known that you don't appreciate the pastor, and you don't like what they're doing at the conference office, and, nah, 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 and you're complaining about this, and you're complaining about everything else. I don't return my tithe. I don't like what they do to it. I don't like the way they 
use my tithe. All right. So where do you put your money? In a bank. Do you like the way the bank uses your money? You know who they loan it to? They don't just loan it to the good angels. So you don't want the conference investing your money in saving souls because you figure they should have done it this way instead of that way. And so you give it to the bank, and they loan it to pornographers and, and, and everybody. So you're satisfied with that. Yeah, I'll leave you to reconcile that because I can't figure that out at all. Ladies and gentlemen, our light affliction is but for a moment. What happens when your idols get taken away? What happens? What happens when your freedoms are restricted? You know something about that. And by the way, I'm just so glad that I lived in Tennessee and not in Michigan. You all went through stuff that I did not want to go through. But what happens? What happens when somebody says, your church is closed, but the casinos are open? I don't make any sense at all. Of course it's crazy. But you can't do much about it except choose how you react to it. What happens on the day that you are the innocent party and you don't get justice? What happens when you are the victim and you have been victimized? Again, don't take my remarks to an illogical extreme. I don't want you to do that, not even for a moment. But in the midst of it all, God has given you the opportunity and the grace to be a Christian and to let people see Jesus working in your life. The winds of strife are being let loose. The Spirit of God is being withdrawn from this world. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, that's what we want to see happen. We want Jesus to come, and we know that these are the steps that we must go to to get from here to the second coming of Jesus. I mean, what did you expect it to be like? Did you expect your life to be a picnic, and then suddenly, boom, mark of the beast, and then Jesus comes back? Now, we are working up to that now, and things are getting unpredictable, and things are getting untenable in many cases. And God is looking to his people, and he's saying, do they understand the teachings of the Bible? Great. But do they really understand the teachings of the Bible? And are they representing me by manifesting the character of Jesus even when things go wrong? What a world in which we live. I heard this story just a few days ago. only happened last month. A small plane, it might have been a Cessna, flying off the coast of Florida from one place to another. The pilot slumped over the, the wheel, and he became unresponsive. His passengers sitting up front with him realized, we're going to die. He didn't know how to fly the plane. He grabbed the radio and he called the control tower. We've got a real problem here. Pilot is unresponsive. I don't know how to fly a plane. What do I do? Here we are, friend, in this world. we got a problem. It's as though the world is unresponsive. And somehow we've got to navigate this, these troubled waters and get from here to eternity. How in the world? It just so happened that at the control tower there was a, an air traffic controller who for 20 years had been a flight attendant, uh, not a flight attendant, a flight instructor. He said to man, you're going to land the plane. I can't land the plane. And I don't know if he said it, but I would have said, so what do you suggest? <laughs> pilot is completely unresponsive. The story ends well, and you know it's going to. The pilot made a complete recovery. He can thank the non-pilot for saving his life. So what do I do? Okay, let's do this. Can you get the plane up and down? Yes, can you do a little side to side? Yes, following the instructions. And so he aimed him for a distant runway, and he said, you just keep flying in that direction. Lower, 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 slower. You see that control thing? Yes. You see that switch? Sure. You understand what's going on? Yes. The man was flying the plane. And he managed to position him such that he got it right above the runway. Lower, 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 lower. You understand the parallel here, don't you? We are in a crazy, troubled world. But there is someone who will give us directions. There's someone to tell us, lower or higher, left or right. There's someone who will tell us, bite your tongue right now. There's someone who will say, no, 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 just say God bless you. There are someone who will say, you don't need to win the argument right now. There's someone who will say, 
be gracious. There's someone who will say, back off. There's someone who will say, pray right now. You need to pray right now. Pray right now. That somebody is, 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 is the spirit of Almighty God. I was so thankful that the prayer was a prayer for the Holy Spirit because in this world where the Spirit of God is being withdrawn, we must be filled with the Spirit of Almighty God. This isn't something where a little will do. You must get much. And the Bible said the verse was quoted in prayer. Thank you, Pastor. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that do what? To them that ask. It's just that simple. How many times did you ever say to your children, I wish you'd have just asked, and you would have given, or you would have done, or you would have assisted, or you would have helped. And God is that God. He's waiting for us to just ask. Friend, as society piles on, as things spiral downwards, oh, no, no, I think we're in free fall now. There is still a God in heaven. The Holy Spirit is not dead. He's being withdrawn from the world, not from you. And God will pour His Spirit into your life. Finally, the air traffic controller said, cut the power. And I don't know how many feet off the runway they were, but the plane dropped, bounced a little, kept on going straight. Don't forget to put on the brake. He braked. The air traffic controller came down from the tower, ran out onto the strip. It wasn't Miami International. Embraced the man, forgot to get his name. We didn't even know who he was. Landed the plane. Got everyone safely home. Everyone, I think, was two, him and the pilot. Got them all back. Never flown a plane before, but listened to the voice of the instructor. Come on, friend, now is the time to be listening as more closely than ever before. Jesus is coming back soon. I cannot promise you that the world is going to get better. It isn't. It's going to get worse. But Jesus is coming back. He will make all things new, and he promises you the privilege of his companionship, his friendship, his Holy Spirit, his guiding light. He'll land this plane and will safely make it to the other side. Can you say amen tonight? Come on and let's pray with me right now. Let's pray our Father in heaven. We thank you. There's a great God in heaven who will give to the struggling, even to the erring, a great measure of his Holy Spirit. I thank you that we can go from here tonight saying, ah, it's a crazy world. But why get angry? The Spirit of God is being withdrawn. We can be compassionate. We can be understanding. We can be Christian by your grace. Now, Lord, please, not even for a moment, don't leave us to ourselves. There's no good thing in us. We can't make it without you. But if you would fill us with your spirit, fill your church with your spirit, fill our meetings and our worship services with your spirit, be in the midst of our disagreements where we are exchanging points of view. Teach us to be, to, to be people who would build uh, uh, bridges not erect fences, not barriers. People who would love even the folks who disagree with us, even the people who would make our life difficult, even the people that it seems to us are out of their mind. Fill our minds with your presence. Keep us in this world. If you keep us in this world, then you'll be able to keep us in the world to come. We thank you and we love you. We ask your blessing tonight. Change us, Lord. Grow us. Let us behold Jesus and be changed and manifest his character. Would you do that for us? We ask it of you in Jesus' name. And together we said, amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow night or tomorrow morning for early worship. Have a wonderful night. God be with you.
fall.